Zenvo just released their Aurora Hypercar, and in this video we're going to go through and analyze the aerodynamics of one of the models, the Agile. For those of you that are new to my channel, I was an aerodynamicist for Mercedes for the 2018, 19, and 20 Formula 1 seasons, and I now work as an aerodynamics consultant designing aerodynamics kits for race cars in all different classes all around the world. Now the reason we're looking at the Agile and not the other road-going version, the Tour, is that the Agile has the more interesting aerodynamics package, and it also claims some aerodynamic numbers, so we have a little bit more to work with from an analysis front. Now, let's first look at those aerodynamics numbers. The claimed downforce figure is 880 kilos at 250 kilometers per hour. Now, this equates to an SCZ of about 2.9. Now, that is actually quite a low number. I kind of thought, given some of the aerodynamic detailing on the car, the number might be a bit higher. The efficiency of the car is quoted at 2.5 to 1, which gives an SCX of about 1.16, give or take a bit, and that is more or less what I would expect given the body and the general looks of the car. Now, with any sort of hypercar or road-going high-performance car, there are a large number of compromises that have to be made between styling and aerodynamics, because obviously you have to sell the car so it's got to look great, so it can't just be raw aero performance. And I'll try to cover off which items on the car I think are more a styling feature and more aerodynamics features, and we'll go through and work out what everything is doing on the car. So anyway, let's get into it. Now to start off with, let's talk about the aerodynamic architecture of the car. Now, the reason I originally wanted to make a video on this car is because I think it's got quite an interesting aerodynamic layout, and there's quite a few little cool details on the car. Basically, the car is a very high through-flow design. So this section of the bodywork just here is all a giant hole, and that uh, is basically open. Uh, there's the sidewall of the chassis here, but it's open and blows through the whole way out behind the wheels. So this is all open through here, so air can just go along here. And there's the same situation at the rear wheels, where there's a giant gap for air to come in the back here, as we'll see when we get along there later. You also can see big holes here and here, in addition to obviously the front holes over here. So what we're looking at here is essentially a disguised open wheeler. You can imagine that there's basically a central tub through here, and then there's the wheel pods at the outer portions, but in between those areas, it's basically free air. Now, the other part of the architecture is, of course, the cooling layout. Now, this car has a hybrid powertrain. It's got a quad-turbo V12 that makes 1,250 horsepower, so quite a lot of combustion power, which means quite a lot of cooling from that. And then it's also got a smaller hybrid motor on top of that. So all of those systems are going to require cooling. Now, in the center, we have this very large knacker that feeds a central cooler in here. I've seen that this is the intercooler core. And then beyond that, we're going to have to get a little bit into speculation because the cooling layout further isn't super clear. There's this big grill at the front, which I'm going to hazard a guess has a cooler behind it. But if you have a look, there's no vents on the top in the center here, which is where I would normally vent a cooler. So like if I was letting air flow in the front through here, I'd normally have some big vents here to let air flow over the top. Uh, that's not there, so the cooler is obviously not venting out the top, which means it must be either venting out the sides or underneath. Or if it's not doing either of those, it has to be flowing through the middle of the transmission tunnel. Now, there is some evidence to suggest that it could be venting out the bottom. If you look at this particular section here on this image of the, the Tur, obviously it's not the Agile, it's a, a different car, but still the same overall architecture, you'll see that it looks like there's not a complete set of floor paneling through here. Now, obviously this car is on a hoist and there's a lot of other details where perhaps they have removed a panel here, but it is possible that uh, there is venting from the cooling going beneath the floor. Now, if I was designing the car, that would be personally something I would try to avoid. Putting cooling air from here through a radiator down under the floor is generally not something that you want to do. So let's look at the alternative theory of the side outlets. I've lightened up one of the shots from the marketing material and what you'll see is there's this quite large cutout just in under here. And I think this could be indications of where the cooling air is exiting. Potentially it's, it's coming through a center core and then coming out the side here. Now, again, this is still not somewhere where I would ideally want cooling air. I would go over the top, but I wonder if this is one of those styling versus aero compromises where the, the styling team wanted a hood that didn't have uh, any vents in it. So the only option is to go and route it out the side here. So obviously that's going to compromise because you're going to have lower energy flow here. Some of that could get drawn below the floor if you have a, a far enough forwards diffuser or a floor that's making a lot of suction. 
uh, and anything that's left is going to just flow down as losses down the side towards your rear end. So that's why you'd probably want to go over the top, but I think that this is a plausible area that the cooling could be exiting. Now the final theory is that there's some cooling going down the center line of the car. So that would be in this transmission tunnel here. Now this particular model, the Agile, there is only a rear wheel drive powertrain. So this would theoretically be vacant space. Uh, and so you could uh, pipe some air from that front inlet back and through here into the rear engine bay. That is one potential option. However, on the tour, there's obviously an all wheel drive powertrain. So there's gonna be some drivetrain components up the front. I'm not sure whether they're doing the all-wheel drive just through electric motors on the front axle or whether they're passing a drive shaft through here, but you could potentially have some things taking up that volume there, in which case you wouldn't be able to run that center line cooling, which is why it's probably more likely that it's going to be coming out these vents over here. If you have a closer look at the rear of the car, and this is the rear wheel just over here, you'll see what looks like a very small scoop just along here. And that looks like that could be taking in some inlet air into the engine bay, coming in through the side and into the engine bay. It's worth noting that there doesn't seem to be any big radiator inlets back here. I was kind of expecting to see uh, a little bit more in the way of, of inlet back here to try and cool down that engine. Maybe there was a rear mounted cooler or something like that, especially given how high the power levels are. Then of course, if you look at the rear, the only outlets on the rear are this central one above the diffuser and this central one below the diffuser here. And these will allow the, the exit of the air that's being ingested in through that scoop at the top. So we've obviously still got the roof scoop that feeds that intercooler core. And it will also uh, feed out any air that's drawn in by any of those side scoops will come out either one of these top or bottom ones. Now, before we move on to the aero performance, I just want to have a final note on the tub structure. This is the underlying core uh, that lies beneath all the body panels. And you can see there's quite a tight space at the front here. It's kept very tight along there. There's plenty of free space forward. So really you can do whatever you want in this forwards area. You can see some cutouts that may be potentially used for getting drivetrain components, perhaps uh, a little bit of cooling through flow if there's a motor or something in there that, that you've got to get some cooling air in and out. And then you can see that it sits as tight as possible to the seats along here uh, and then goes along to the rear where again you've got another cutout there that is probably again used for managing some of that cooling air in and out as well as drivetrain and suspension components. Now let's move on to the fun stuff which is of course the aero performance. Now as I've mentioned, this car has the opportunity for a huge amount of through flow through it. And as a result, it's been able to go for a real front wing setup. So if you have a look along here, we've got this sort of outboard portion between the tire uh, and outboard of the sort of uh, chassis center line. That is in a three element wing. So we have element one, which is the main splitter, element two there, and element three there. Now you should be able to get a lot of extraction uh, and a lot of suction on the main plane from this particular setup, assuming it's vented well at the back, which for this particular car, there's plenty of room there. There should be plenty of venting at the back. You would expect that you can get a lot of downforce out of that. On the outboard side, you'll see that the wheel pod just does the bare minimum to cover the wheel over here. And you'll see there's just a narrow bridge over there. Now, some of that bridge is going to be a, a styling item, uh, but of course there are some structural components to being able to hold everything together over here. The splitter is capped with a rounded up end plate like this. So basically the main plane sweeps up into the end plate. Now with that end plate, a lot of you are probably tempted to think of something like an infinity wing because it's got that sweep up. But the reality is, is that this car's not working so much like that. With the really high through flow, it's not like this is all blocked in like a regular car and we have a large amount of lateral flow here. The flow here is gonna be largely along the car because there's just not that much stagnation pressure on top of the wing because we don't have that much blockage. Of course, there is going to be lateral flow, no doubt, across the top surface, uh, but it's not quite like a conventional GT car. The end plate is canted in slightly from top view, and this is something that's usually a favorable detail because like I mentioned, you will have some of that lateral flow, and therefore you're going to end up wanting to align a little bit to that flow so that when the flow whips around here, you don't have a really lossy vortex roll up or a localized separation on the front of the end plate. This shot also shows quite nicely the cutout holes in the front, which these are going to relieve any pressure that's being built up by the upwash of the front wing in here. Now, moving further rearwards, you'll see some interesting details on the floor leading edge. You'll see that it actually comes back here and then it has a step out then a flat edge and then it steps again. Now, 
This, uh, as long as they've aligned this leading edge correctly or it's, it's rounded correctly, should generate a reasonable amount of vorticity off the side because basically you have a whole bunch of air smacking into the top. The bodywork is outwashing at this point, so it will generate some circulation around this edge. You'll get a bit of vorticity that will then go under the car floor, so you'll basically spool up a vortex. That will generate a little bit of suction under the floor, should improve your overall performance in terms of both front and rear downforce. You also note up here, the suspension is uh, aero fairing, so they're all properly aero shaped, so they should be relatively low losses off them and it will get a slight drag reduction on that. But obviously they've got a styling detail here, which is the exposing of the suspension members. Now you, you wouldn't actually want to expose uh, the damper and the spring unit to the airflow normally because uh, that spring is not the most aerodynamic thing. If you've got airflow moving over that, it's going to produce uh, losses that are going to travel downstream. Similarly with the push rod, the push rod is obviously a circular push rod, it's circular in cross section, and that is not something that's ideal either. So again, just going back to the fact that there are some styling compromises you have to make on a car like this. Looking at this vein just here, you can see that it's an outwashing vein just behind the tire, so it should pressurize this region just behind the tire, which should generate a bit of outwash and help suppress the tire wake by pushing it outboard. And keeping that tire wake further outboard is going to be important for improving rear downforce and improving the flow through the rearwards open section on the back of the car. While we're on the front end, another neat little detail is the full cake tin scoop. You'll see it just here. As far as I can tell, this car uses independent cake tin scoops for front and rear. So basically there's no hosing or anything connected to the body, which is generally speaking a really good solution. You don't want to use a flexible hose if you can avoid it. And having plenty of through flow allows this to work quite well. So that's going to go and feed the brake disc and caliper and cool everything down there. It is worth noting though, that things like exposed tie rod ends here, instead of being integrated to the cake tin, are a, a fairly sizable compromise. And I wonder how much of that is being driven by uh, the fact that they've got the, the push rod very vertical here. So you can see the push rod is very vertical, which is very efficient from a loading standpoint. It decreases push rod loads, the more vertical you get it. So it's more structurally efficient. Uh, but obviously if you make it this vertical, this particular point is going to be in the free stream. This is quite a critical point in terms of how you design the cake tin. So that's going to cause diminished aero performance. So that's a bit of the, the balance between designing for mech optimization and aero optimization right there. Looking at the rear cake tin, you can see this is the rear cake tin cooling scoop just here. So there's looking down from just behind the rear cake tin, looking forwards, and that's the scoop that cools the rear. So again, one of the advantages of that high through flow concept is that you're getting all this air through here that you can then use for cooling. Again, same notes on the rear as the front where we have a large number of exposed suspension components here uh, that is something that is not aerodynamically optimal because obviously every bit that the airflow moves over is going to create uh, losses and separations because these are not smooth aero surfaces. Now, one of the details on the car that's pretty great from a usability front, but not so good from an aero front is this door design here. Now, it's quite clever what they've done. Basically, they put the bottom of the floor on the door here so that when you open the door, you don't have the floor in your way along here. And it means you can just walk up and hop it into the cockpit, which is going to be a little bit nicer than the majority of supercars with wide floors and smaller doors. However, there's no seal or anything between either portion of the door and their respective mating surfaces here. So this creates a gap between these surfaces. Now, if you have a gap here, what that's inherently going to mean is you're going to bleed through some flow. And that means that if you're generating good suction under the floor over here, you're basically going to drag air from above the floor to below the floor through that gap. And because it's coming out sort of perpendicular to the floor, instead of being a nice sort of louvered floor edge, what will happen is that that will jet into the airstream and you'll generate a lot of losses under the floor here and that will impact the performance of your diffuser. So great for usability, it's quite a neat design feature, but that is gonna come at an aero cost. Moving to this back shot, you can see really how tight the rear taper's in. It's quite small uh, given the size of the engine that they've got going this thing too. And you can see that it's got tons of room for air to flow through this portion here. Now, interestingly though, they've left the boat region at the bottom quite wide compared to where I would put it. Like I would probably optimize for a boat that's small like this. So I know they've made a custom gearbox for this car. 
uh, and I know they've probably got quite a few constraints around packaging in a powertrain of, of this sort of size in this car. So perhaps they needed this bigger boat in order to just fit all their mechanical components at the rear. That could potentially explain why they have such a fat boat there. Looking at the bodywork, you'll notice some neat detailing. This whole bit here of the bodywork where the lights are attached to is basically set up to act like a beam wing, which is really quite neat. Uh, it's a very tidy implementation. It's something that still kind of looks like a car from outside, but when you look at it, it actually just is a beam wing. The diffuser is relatively conventional. Uh, there's nothing too crazy about it. It's got a little bit of lateral expansion at the rear and the kick line starts relatively far forward, but it's pretty gentle. I'll show you from a different shot. So from this view, if we trace the line of the diffuser down, you can just follow along this kink here, which looks like it's the roof of the diffuser there. And you can see it blends down into a fillet with the floor along here. You can see that it's starting probably about here, maybe about 100, 200 millimeters in front of the tire. Uh, and then it's just having a very gentle opening expansion that then does a progressive ramp uh, and still fairly gentle by the rear, but it's ramped up a little bit more by the time you've passed the rear axle center line. Now it's a fairly conservative diffuser approach, which is probably why the car is generating those relatively low downforce numbers that I mentioned earlier. But by the same token, it's an approach that would be relatively consistent uh, and safe in terms of you're not gonna get any weird diffuser separations or anything like that. Just highlighting another styling detail versus aero detail is you'll notice that the way that this line carves out here from the body, you'll see that the curvature of this panel has had to go in a way that is a bit strange from an aero front because we've ended up with this sharp leading edge with variable curvature as we're going inboard. So that's another area where the styling team would have been dictating what the shapes are here uh, more so than, than any direct aero influence. Now going up to the rear wing, you'll see that what we have is an active aero rear wing. You can see two actuators here. So this wing is gonna be uh, active in tilt. So you're gonna be angling up and down. And of course, Zenvo is, is no stranger to active aero rear wings. They famously have that tilty rear wing on one of their cars. Given, however, that this is a fairly cranked two element wing, uh, I'm gonna hazard a guess that most of the benefit of going active when this thing cranks up is going to be uh, acting as an air brake under braking. The rear wing itself is a 3D design. Obviously we have a little bit of downwash from the canopy. So this particular section here has a lifted nose to deal with that. And we've got more cranked outboard portions where obviously the wheel arches at the outboard side are flowing air more directly along the car instead of downwashing it. Now one thing that's interesting to note with this wing is that there is a lot of overlap between the wing and the top deck. I would chalk this up to a styling compromise because I wouldn't be surprised if you trimmed the top deck back a lot more or shifted the rear wing rearwards, if you end up with a lot more performance because you wouldn't have so much suction mirroring off the bottom of the rear wing and the top of the top deck. Because uh, if you have a look, the top deck actually isn't really kicking up much at the end. It's kind of staying real flat. And perhaps some of this is because of the relative proportions between the two models. They might have wanted to keep the top deck length similar between the two models, uh, but they maybe found that they didn't like how the car was going if they put the rear wing further rearwards. Or maybe there were structural concerns with, with how this is anchoring. Obviously, the further rearwards you put a rear wing, the more load you're going to put on these members uh, and the heavier everything has to be to compensate. And that is my analysis of the Zenvo Aurora. Well, that's all for this analysis. Thanks for watching. If you liked it, don't forget to hit that like button and leave a comment below on what videos you'd like to see next from me. Subscribe to my channel for more content like this and hopefully I'll see you next time.